Father, Father stands, 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 one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Welcome to the Monday, March 4th meeting of the Board of Aldermen. Uh, I'd just like to make a brief, quick announcement. Normally, this meeting is not televised live on PEG TV because uh, town meeting day is the next day, but tonight we are live. So I would ask everyone here to refrain from any vote for me or vote for so-and-so or vote this way or that way on any particular ballot measure um, because he'll have to quickly pull the plug if somebody says something like that because PEG can't broadcast those sorts of things. All right, so our first order of business is minutes of the previous meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion. It's been seconded. Are there any corrections or revisions to the minutes? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Public comment. This is a portion of the meeting where members of the public are invited to address the board on matters not on our agenda. Are there any members of the public here who wish to speak? Go right ahead. <laughs> Let me know you wanted to speak. Welcome. Yeah. So thank you very much for letting us come speak to you. Um, I'm Karen Nonfehi, and I'm the chair of Soup Bowls for Hunger. And Soup Bowls for Hunger this year is our 18th, and we're back in person. All right. um, so I'm going to let one of my goals when I took this over a few years ago was to get a lot more students involved. OK, and so I brought one of our key potters tonight. So I'm going to let Sophia Perone talk with you a little bit about what she did, and then I'll bring you back. Um, hello, as she mentioned, my name is Sophia Perone. I'm a sophomore at Rowland High School, and this is my second year helping out with soup bowls for hunger. Um, not only is this a fundraiser to help out those in our community who are going without food, it's also a community event. Um, it brings together several people um, through helping prepare for the event, volunteering for the event, and the actual event itself. Um, uh, I personally have really enjoyed ceramics since I started it last year and having this event as a way to um, work on my pieces and without having to bring home a million different bowls for my family um, <laughs> is it's really cool and it's also I'm able to help friends say hey come along come do this thing with me it helps out the community and um, it's very nice to see like kitchens from around the, uh, I almost said country, from around the county uh, helping out um, uh, on this with us. And it's a really nice night. I helped volunteer last year. And last year it was fun. I was just kind of running orders out to cars with my friend. But this year I'll actually be helping out more because it's in person again, which means you actually get to pick out your bowl, which is a very more uh, personal process to see what you like. It, it's always so special to have like a handmade piece in your own house. Um, having, you know, it's, it's uh, in a more personal manner. It's very special to me to know that someone could be eating out of something that I, you know, made that I worked on. So not only is it like this, oh, you get a bowl. It's also nice for the person who made the bowl. Um, so it's um, this year it's going to be in person and you'll get to you know choose your soups choose all your what I mean you've always been able to choose your soups but <laughs> you'll uh, uh, choose your bowls you'll sit down you'll have a nice meal and it'll just be an amazing event and I believe it would be uh, amazing if everyone could you know come or tell your family about it tell your friends about it um, because it's, it's just a really nice thing that the community does and it's something that's been happening for a while and it's something that I continue to hope happen that I hope continues to happen for a while longer. Thank so we're going to have two more years because she's only a sophomore. Which is great. <laughs> um, so she's right. The past three years we did a drive through or an online because the food shelves needed the money. Right? Because all of the proceeds, this is one of my favorite kind of projects because a lot of people do a small part. You know, oh, I can donate soup. We have like 17 restaurants that donate fabulous soups and bakers donating desserts. Allen Street last year made 12 dozen cookies and they were so excited. And we have, we have music, we have an online basket raffle and the basket raffle is completely run by students. That'll be online as well as in person, but all the rest of it will be in person. It goes to local food shelves, not only the Mission, Brock, but also Pulteney Food Shelf, Pittsburgh, Proctor, Brandon, Killington. Um, so this is your community. The other thing I like about it is, Sophia said, yes, it's going toward feeding people who need food, 
but there's also a crisis of isolation. And so people who come in are part of this. People who come help out. People who come sit down with their friends and family who have a dinner. That's the other mission. So I want to thank you and encourage you. We've got some save the date flyers. The posters will be all over the place starting Wednesday. Um, and I look forward to seeing many of you that night. And thanks for the time. Thank Do you, you just want to say the date one more time yes. for the folks it's at home? It's April 11th at the Rutland High School cafeteria, two seatings, 445 and 615. And as Sophia said, you get a beautifully handmade bowl, your choice of soups, uh, beautiful dinner roll, dessert, and we've got higher end silent auctions, including farmhouse pottery, Han Toon print, uh, Hubbardton Forge lamp, um, Miranda Thomas pottery, and we're working on dinner and a night at the theater. Nice. So there are some high-end items as well as uh, at least 12 to 15 student-themed baskets <laughs> for the raffle. Thanks in advance for your support. Thank really you. Really appreciate you. the time. Thank you. Thanks again. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board? Barbara? Barbara Spaulding and Ed Bove of the Rutland Redevelopment Authority. We would like to take this opportunity to thank both Larry Tupoli and Cheryl Hooker for their service on the Board of Aldermen and to the City of Rutland. We would especially like to thank Cheryl for serving as the Aldermanic Liaison to the Rutland Redevelopment Authority Board. Cheryl has been on our board since 2022 when she replaced former Alderman Thomas Franco. She came onto our board during a time of transition and helped raise up the organization by communicating with others the dedication and work being done by the RRA. I am personally grateful to her for her support while I was alone in the office trying to keep projects moving forward. She always had words of praise and encouragement for me during times when I really needed to hear them. There have also been many good times over the past year and a half at the RRA. We celebrated milestones and had some fun. Cheryl and her husband participated in the RRA Olympics. Her husband won a gold medal. <laughs> and the board and staff also celebrated the holidays together with more games and competitions. Cheryl has always been a team player and we will miss her. On behalf of the RRA staff and the board, we want to extend to Cheryl the title of Board Emeritus <laughs> which means she is excused from meetings and motions, <laughs> but will always be welcome at RRA functions. Please accept these flowers in gratitude for your commitment to us and the city of Rutland. Oh. Thank you. Sorry, you weren't the representative. <laughs> Half of those are mine. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak before the board on items not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to communications from the mayor. Good evening. I don't have flowers for anyone. I apologize. <laughs> But I will say thank you. We have five board members that uh, tonight is the last night of this two-year session for them, um, or one-year sessions for Larry and Cheryl. So Larry and Cheryl, first of all, thank you. Congre congratulations on your retirement, and uh, thank you for part your effort to step up and participate and run one-year seats that needed to be filled. That's a, it's a big ask, and we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Uh, and good luck uh, to Michael, Anna, and Sharon uh, in the next election tomorrow. All right. Um, I want to say thank you to Tracy and the clerk's office for all their work on the election prep. Good luck tomorrow. Have fun. Yeah. Uh, don't work too hard, but we expect uh, it'll, it'll be a, a, a long day for you. So <laughs> have fun with that. Um, <laughs> uh, we, uh, I got to go up to a legislative session and speak uh, in the legislative session last week. Uh, I spent some time in Montpelier doing that, and I testified on uh, the tax sale redemption period bill 
that was sponsored uh, out of, sponsored and driven here out of Rutland. And I think it was important to have that conversation about that one year period and making sure that we have the ability to secure buildings, um, especially if they're vacant or blighted during that time period uh, to keep them safe if that's the case. So um, you can follow that online on the legislator's website. Um, WCAX now has a local presence in town. Um, they have a, essentially a, a bureau back in Rutland. It's been a long time since we've seen that and I just wanted to kind of point that out as we're getting attention again um, you know there's been a gap over the years and post COVID it's nice to see <clears throat> it's nice to see the uh, the media attention that I think that our, our community deserves and we're getting those stories you know uh, WCX is doing stories on a weekly basis if not a semi daily basis um, on the news about Rutland and that's fantastic uh, Rutland County Head Start um, had the ribbon cutting for their uh, early Head Start program. So for those of you who don't know, this is a, a younger uh, daycare program, an educational program for, for children. And, and you know, it's something that is desperately needed in our community. We actually continue to desperately need more and more early childhood education and child care options. But to see this program uh, expanded, to look at the support that we received from our delegation to Washington um, and how much effort and emphasis they put behind it and how Rutland was able to receive that funding and that opportunity to have this is great. And I am really excited to see the Community Care Network step up, take that role on and move forward with that. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Um, I have lots of other things we can, we can go over, but with a, a long day tomorrow for most of us, I'll keep it short. I just want to um, throw out there that with uh, elections tomorrow, the clerk's office will be closed. Um, so if you need anything, we ask that you send an email or you come in on Wednesday for the clerk's office. Other than that, uh, that's it for me tonight. Any other questions? All right. Have Thank a good you. evening. You're welcome. Moving on to additions and deletions to the agenda. Alderwoman Tadio? I would like to delete my report for the Environmental Sustainability Committee. All right. Do we have any other additions or deletions to the agenda? Does that motion have a second? Second. All right. So we have a motion to delete the Environmental Sustainability Report from the agenda. It has been seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All right. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next is reports and letters from department heads and officials. First up, we have Ed Bowe from the Rutland Redevelopment Authority with a request to refer the city's market rate revolving loan fund program to committee for discussion of proposed modifications. There's a memo and supporting documents on pages 1 to 12 of your packet. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. And um, good luck tomorrow as well. Though I don't think I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> So tonight I'd like to refer to committee uh, the Rutland Market Rate RLF program. Uh, Melanie Paskovich, the Interim Director of NeighborWorks of Western Vermont, attended the RRA board meeting last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember. And there was some discussion on the proposed changes which are in your packet and it was decided to refer that to committee. So that's what I'm here doing tonight. One note, your memo had said to refer it to charter and ordinance. The program is developed in community and economic development. Would that be the appropriate? I believe so. No worries. So move. Who wants it? Oh, yeah. All the Roman time. I would move to refer um, the Rutland Market Rate RLF program to community and economic development. Second. Second. All right. So we have a motion to refer this item to committee. It has been seconded. Any discussion on the referral? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Um, one more thing. Yep. Actually, two more things. Um, on that program, there actually is a potential closing tomorrow for uh, two of the awards um, on West Street. So that's kind of exciting news. So there is something happening on that. And I just want to um, bring to other people's attention that there are two new other programs coming back online. There's the VHIP program, which is the Vermont Housing Improvement Program. Um, which is a grant and this year it's opened up to fair market rents and that's opening soon um, I think March 25th actually so that's an exciting one and then there's also the VHFA rental RLF um, revolving loan fund which was just uh, dropped two days ago so um, also exciting that's a low interest RLF you can get like $100,000 for market rate on that as well so um, you can mix and match some of these with the one that we're referring to committee we can also use that one with some of these other funding sources as well so there's um, 
uh, a lot of opportunities out there, and we at the RRA have been um, taking lots of calls from potential developers that I think this is supposed to target. So that's super exciting. So thank you. Alderman Gillum. Uh, just for the people at home, where do they find that information? At your website? No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, right now, best to call me. <laughs> um, and then uh, VHFA, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, um, is the rental RLF. The other two programs aren't open yet because we're referring one to committee and the other one is through ACCD, so there's no place to refer those to yet. Okay. But there will be soon, and hopefully that will be on our and website. And we'll get that on our website. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next up is Chief Lovett with three grant requests. Supporting documents for these requests were emailed to board members this morning. The first is for the 2024 <coughs> Homeland Security Grant to replace the technical rescue trailer. Chief Lovett. Yes. Um, just to give you a, a progress report, the uh, 2023 Homeland Security Grant that we secured for the hazmat trailer, <coughs> that trailer was delivered last week, and uh, uh, Chief Getney and the rest of the firefighters got that trailer outfitted and ready to go. It's actually in service now. We're just waiting for decals, so we can progress quickly if we can get the materials. So with that in light, um, tonight I uh, have before me three grants that we need to apply for or we have been in the process of doing. First one is going to be another grant very similar to the one that brought us to Homeland Security. Uh, um, trailer, the hazmat trailer, for the replacement of our existing technical rescue trailer. Now, this grant is a little unusual because we found out about it. I heard a rumor about it um, last Friday, the 23rd actually, I think it was. And uh, so I, I made the questions to Homeland Security if it was possible for a fire department to ask for it. This was a grant that was primarily focused towards law enforcement. So on Monday morning when I found out, yes, we could actually do it, I came down and talked to the mayor, and knowing that we had a timeline where it had to be submitted last Friday, we didn't have an awful lot of time. So knowing that and the fact that we wouldn't have a match on this grant if we won it, mayor said to go forward with it with the intention of coming before you tonight to ask forgiveness, so to speak, <laughs> for the fact. So with that, um, I'm hoping for a motion to allow the mayor to, if we ex uh, are, uh, granted this, to accept it and sign for the city. So moved. <coughs> Second. 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 Got to suspend the rules first, so. Oh. My bad. Could I get a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. Second. Second. All, right. All right, so we have a motion to suspend the rules. It has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And I'd entertain a motion to authorize the mayor to sign the 2024 Homeland Security Grant on behalf of the city. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Is the, are there any discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next. Okay. The next grant that we've got in the hopper, so to speak, and that's due on Friday, is the 2023 uh, uh, American Fire Grant, Firefighter Grant Program. And this grant is designed to supplement budgets when financial uh, hardship has been proven <laughs> to supplement with equipment and training that we quite likely would not be able to secure. Uh, we've been rather successful in this grant program over the past. Um, the target for this grant this year will be the replacement of our firefighter turnout gear washer and dryer. These are things that uh, we're one of the first projects I started in 2004, they've worn out. Uh, it's kind of a pricey situation. Um, right now we're looking at about $43,000. This grant would have a 10% match. So um, I do have the money in the budget to cover this grant, uh, the match anyway, not the grant itself. And uh, it seems pretty probable uh, because of the age of the equipment that will be successful in this one. <laughs> so uh, I would hope that the board would allow us to go forward and allow when we do receive it, that the mayor can sign for it. Alderman McCann. Motion to suspend the rules. Second. second. All right, we have a motion to suspend the rules. It has been seconded. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And I make a motion to allow the chief to apply for the 2023 AFG grant and if successful, authorize the mayor to sign on behalf of the city. Second. 
All right, so we have a motion to authorize the chief to apply and the mayor to sign on behalf of the city. It has been seconded. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And once again, Chief? And the last thing I have is the BRIC grant. BRIC grant is a grant program that uh, has been started a few years ago, and basically it's designed to help a community do a hazard analysis of their community. This would set in place documentation that, oh, say an item is um, close to failing, maybe is under, uh, undersized for a culvert, so on and so forth, and it creates a list of, and it lets us know where our, uh, our vulnerabilities are. <coughs> What's good about that is as grants come available, there may be grants specifically focused for road work, and we can pull this uh, data out, and we know which one to apply, and we can work quicker towards it. So it's something we've been trying for so many years to get uh, going, and now the brick grant is here. So um, the mayor had asked me to go forward with it. All the paperwork is in, and uh, they're uh, preparing a document that would be presented to the mayor for a signature, basically extending the state's help for us to get this uh, grant program going. Uh, once we do that, once we have the money in place, we would uh, put out RFPs, solicit a vendor, and then execute the grant. There is a cost sharing on this grant, from what I understand. Um, our in-kind work that uh, we will do to help support this grant will more than cover that, uh, <laughs> similar to what we did with the Dunkley Dam project. So with that, uh, I ask that the uh, board would support the motion that when the mayor receives the packet, if it looks proper, to allow him to sign it. Move to suspend the rules. Second. We have a motion to suspend the rules. It's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Move to, move to allow the chief to apply for the Building Resilience Infrastructure and Communities Grant? I think we just need a motion to authorize the mayor to sign and accept the grant. Okay. That's right, because it's already been, put in, the application has already been put in place. Well, it, it was the, we expressed our interest and filled out the paperwork for it. Okay. I understand it's in the works and we should receive it in the next couple of days. So with that wording about the mayor signing? All right, so we to second. Pay. So we have a motion and it has been seconded to allow the mayor to sign and accept the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Alderman McCann. Just want to let the chief know I appreciate you putting in the work to find these funds and put out for these grants and I see your note here that there was a lot of help from the city treasurer. So thank you for yes. helping with that. It's great to find ways to leverage the funds and the, the expertise we've already got. Thank you. Mayor Dunches? Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment. One thing that, that Rutland and city can benefit from this too is once we have a local hazard mitigation plan in place, we have the ability to apply for funds that in the past we haven't. So having this plan in place actually allows us to do some preventative work when it comes to flood hazard mitigation or other things where in the past that hasn't been available. So I appreciate the board's support. <coughs> All right, any additional debate or discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank, Thank you, you, Chief. Thank you, Billy. Next, we have Administrator Strinisty with an amendment to the development plan relating to 117 State Street and then a request for a referral. There's a memo and a copy of the development plan on pages 13 to 31 of your packet. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm back, everyone, 117 State Street. So as everyone may recall from last meeting, uh, as we were voting to authorize the uh, sale of 117 State Street, uh, a question came up about amending the development plan. Uh, we have since met at the City Owned Properties Committee level to discuss that further, and really the only modification they were looking to do was to eliminate a fifth dwelling unit on the third floor, which more or less uh, wouldn't be conducive to living arrangements. So, uh, so uh, the City Owned Properties Committee is recommending uh, the development plan be amended uh, from four dwelling or from five dwelling units to four dwelling units. Uh, I have a typo there, so I apologize about that. Uh, and then uh, I would be authorizing the sale of 117 State Street. Uh, you know, our takeaway was that this is going to be good for the city, going to be four new dwelling units online. Uh, the, um, the buyers seem to be highly motivated to get this up and going as fast as they can. They're estimating about three months uh, from when they get the, 
the property to uh, being complete and hopefully having tenants move in thereafter. Alder Woman Tadio. Motion to suspend the rules. Second. Second. It's all right. We have a motion to suspend the rules. It's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And I move that to approve um, amending the development plan to for 117 State Street, and I recommend the approval of the conveyance of 117 State Street um, from the Reeds to McCullen Rickett Properties, the second LLC. Second. All right, so we have a motion to approve the amendment to the development plan and authorize the sale. It's been seconded. Any discussion or debate? Alderwoman Davis. So, um, Andrew, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, I don't disagree that the sale is good for the city and it will bring a property online. I'm just a little concerned about how we got there because um, I was reading the information that you had enclosed in the packet. The Reeds purchased the property for about $2,000. And then in 2018, mm -hmm. with the understanding that it had put a, a, develop, a plan together on what they were going to do for the property, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. I, I guess some things got done, uh, maybe a foundation or something got, re yep. got pa repaired. But other than that, not much else occurred, right? Uh, it sounded like they put in flooring and made some other modifications as the, um, the buyers represented during the meeting, about 25% of the work was done. Um, so, so then yeah. it, it says in our own um, statement, it says that if the work does not get completed. Oh, here it is. Um, failure to do so may result in penalties of $100 a day for every day out of compliance. Yeah. That was six years ago. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the stumbling point that I have is um, the sale the, the sale from the Reeds to Ricketts. It, it just seems like Mr. Reeds making an awful lot of money on a property that didn't, shouldn't, it shouldn't happen. Yep. Yeah. And I know that we probably can't, we can't put the lien on, it's too late to apply a lien from the city. Um, but is it possible to, uh, do we have anything to say about the selling price? I just, it doesn't feel right that somebody buys a property for $2,000, doesn't maintain the plan. For some reason, we miss it, whatever happened, happened. We didn't ap apply the, the a lien to the property. And now we're going to sell it for over two hundred thousand, and that's what the Rickett LLC is going to purchase it for. That just doesn't feel right, and it, it, and I don't know what if we can do if we can say you can only sell it for what you have in it, um, and not sell it for. I, have we had it appraised? Is it worth two hundred and some odd thousand dollars? Uh, yeah, so uh, this kind of gets into the, the second item that I'll be presenting, if I can elaborate. I want to vote on the first item. Yeah, yeah, I, I know they, they tie together. So um, as a result, you know, these topics and issues were discussed during the City Owned Properties Committee afterwards. And uh, it, there is a, a glaring issue with someone that gets a property for essentially nothing and, you know, having to uh, or getting a windfall, per se. Um, you know, I think there's two ways to think about this particular situation. And one, um, the the seller is, has put in what they're claiming about 170 to 190 thousand dollars worth of foundational work. Whether that's true or not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, that will probably it would probably come out in an appraisal. Um, but second, I think if we were to um, you know kind of pursue enforcement action, we'll be tying up another building where we want might not want to. So uh, I think the, what ended up resulting from that, uh, that conversation was that we need to go back and look at the city owned properties program as a whole. One, uh, some of these older properties before my time just wasn't, they weren't even on my radar because I either didn't know about them or just completely buried. Um, so uh, I will be looking at all the city owned properties and we're gonna reconvene to discuss uh, you know, what else is on the table? Should we take any enforcement action on those outstanding ones and figure out why they might be outstanding? I think COVID probably played a huge role in things as well, uh, and then prices skyrocketing 
uh, afterwards. So um, those issues were definitely of concern to the City Owned Properties Committee. And I, you know, if, uh, if the board wants to have further dis discussion tonight, I definitely welcome it. Uh, but that is an item that we also want to refer uh, policy per se to one of the committees, which we'll get into next. Thank you. Additional comments or discussion, Alderman Cooperley. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> on the memorandum, um, number one at the bottom, approve the amendment to the development plan allowing the building to be four dwelling units instead of four dwelling yeah, units. Yeah, that's the typo. I, Is that a typo? I meant five I, units to four I just units. Didn't, it didn't make sense. To yeah, me, so. yeah, five units to four units. Sorry about that. Good catch. Any additional discussion or debate on the motion? So we have to, to reiterate, we have a motion to approve the amendment to the development plan and authorize the sale of the property. If there's no further discussion or debate, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Motion passes. All right. Uh, do you want to continue with your motion to refer? Yeah. So uh, as I was explaining, you know, there are some uh, deficiencies in the program, which we'll need to review. I know the city-owned properties are going to reconvene to talk about the um, about the, uh, the, the outstanding properties that we haven't necessarily or haven't been closed on uh, or haven't been issued their certificate of completion. But uh, a while back, back in 2021, uh, I had brought to the board uh, creating a policy around city owned properties uh, just from the pro uh, program as a whole. You know, there are potential uh, issues with uh, how we're currently performing uh, the pro or executing the program. Uh, for example, I'm doing all the advertising of the uh, of these properties, but I also sit on the committee. So it's very hard for me to give advice to applicants because there's a conflict of interest there. So, um, you know, we'll want to look at who should be on the city owned properties committee. Um, probably recommend removing myself, uh, not for less work, but to avoid conflicts of interest. Um, but those are going to be the type of issues that I think we need to re engage with um, and. Uh, refer it back to committee since it's been so long uh the, the first committee went or the initial committee was the general committee i don't know if the board wants to continue with that committee but uh i'll defer to whatever the board wants so i'll move to refer to general all right so we have a motion to refer to general <coughs> excuse me it's been seconded any discussion on the referral no. sorry michael um did we move um to spend the rules yet on this one i don't think we need to for just a referral Apologies. No. So we have a motion to refer. It's been seconded. Alderman Gillum. Um, I'm in the same camp with, with uh, Alderman Davis. Um, I don't think people should be making money, so I think that's something you need to look at with the, with the committee. Um, if they can prove that they put $190,000 in the end, they should be able to get that back. But they have to prove it when they're doing this process. Somehow we need to figure out how to do an audit on before we actually make the um, approval. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. I don't think people should be getting property for a, a discount and then turning around and selling it for a profit. Um, but we also have to explore what the legality is for the city in terms of, uh, I guess, restricting how much they can sell a property for. So that will, we'll have to research it, but you know, in principle, I agree. Any additional debate? So we have a motion to refer the city-owned properties program policy to the general committee. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have Treasurer Markowski with a review of the RFP for city and RRA audit services and a recommendation for audit services for the next three fiscal years. There's a memo and a copy of the proposal on pages 32 to 55 of your packet. Welcome. Thanks. Um, so I think a couple of meetings ago I had asked to go out for bid for audit services for the city so we reached out to seven different firms um, we had two responses one was not able to place a bid but thankful and maybe in the future looking to do that but we did get a response from Sullivan Powers who currently does the city audit so um, I've attached the uh, proposal that they sent, the fee schedule that they sent, um, and I would ask the board to consider accepting this proposal from Sullivan Powers. And um, the base fee for the audit is $73,000 currently. 
the next year's price would be 76,000 and it goes up incremental for the next three years. So just to put a frame of reference of the increase there. And I think we had a stable price that 73,000 over three years. So this um, for information. So I asked mm -hmm. to consider accepting that proposal. I'll move to suspend the rules. Second. All right, motion to suspend the rules has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And I'll move to approve Sullivan Powers and Company for our audit service for FY 24, 25, and 26. Second. All right, so we have a motion to approve and it has been seconded. Any debate? Just Alderman Gillum. Just one. Um, seeing these prices. By giving them a three-year contract, that does keep the price down? Yeah, I think so. And it, if we had to switch audit firms every year, that would be quite a task for okay. the city. For it, it makes sense um, to do it three years. So, um, And I did want to add the that's the city and the RRA services. The RRA is priced separately, and that's up a little bit from uh, prior years. OK, any thank you. Any additional debate? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Next, we'll move to reports of standing committees. We have Alderwoman Savage with a report from the Charter and Ordinance Committee meeting of February 27th. Thank you. Um, the Charter and Ordinance Committee met on February 7th, 27, 2024. <laughs> Members present were myself, Alderman Cooperly, Alderwoman Hooker, Alderwoman Tadio and Alderman McCann and other presents were Mayor Dunges, President Talbot, Alderwoman Davis, Alderwoman McClure, Alderman Barbara Gallo, Attorney LeChance, Chief Cocollin, Animal Control Officer Jones, Commissioner Brown, and Chief Lovett and Gordon Trasillo. Uh, the meeting was called to order at 5.30 p.m. and the topics of the evening uh, to discuss were language revisions to DOGS 13 ROR 2552, 13 ROR 13 2557, and the fire uh, 15 ROR 7 2936. Chair Savage explained to the committee that she met with Commissioner Peg Flory and, and Attorney Le Chance to discuss finding alternative language to replace the term, and I'm going to correct my typo here, it's not viscous, but a vicious <laughs> dog in the city organs. <laughs> During this meeting, it was found that the methods used for determining action needed when there is a reported dog bite could remain the same, and that only the word vicious needed to be addressed. Savage introduced canine behavior or concerning canine behavior to replace the term vicious to the committee as a recommendation from that meeting. After a quick debate, the committee voted 5-0 to accept the language revision to dogs and other animals 13 ROR 2552 and 13 ROR 13-557, replacing the term vicious with concerning canine behavior and send to the board, uh, to the full board, an ISO move. Second. Second. All right, so we have a motion and it has been seconded uh, to accept the language revision to dogs and other animals ordinance. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. The committee next looked at revisions to fire 15 ROR 7-2936 to include language suggested by the fire chief Levitt allowing certain methods of outdoor cooking fires. The chief explained to the committee that ordinance 7-2936, burning in open places or near buildings, could be revised to include the definitions of uh, open burning, which would require a local permit from the fire chief and cooking fires, uh, which use charcoal or LP gas in an outdoor fireplace, a barbecue grill or pit, and to limit the use of wood to be used with a smokeless fire cooker or pit designed for the purpose of preparing food. There was a discussion about whether a fire other than a fire or cooking fire could be permitted uh, and ordinances from other municipalities that define and permit such fires were introduced. Chief Lovett explained that broadening the definition to include such fires could pose some risk to the city. City Attorney Lachance said that new language introduced by the chief could be approved and the topic could remain in, com in committee for further discussion. A motion was made to approve the revisional language to 15 ROR 7-2936, burning in open places or near buildings submitted by Chief Lovett 
and to send to the full board. Uh, motion passed 5-0, and I so move. Second. Second. All right, so we have a motion to approve the revised language related to the fire ordinance. It has been seconded. Discussion or debate? Alderman Gillum? I have a question. Um, I cook in my backyard and I use wood um, in my cooker to smoke th different things. Do this, am I still allowed to do that? This is legalizing that for you. It's for food. So we're food. still allowed to do that. Because I'm pretty sure other people Not are going to ask still, that now question. you would be. Right. You weren't prior. Now I don't know could. if Chief Lovett wants to speak to this, but I think this change was to only allow cooking in smokeless cookers, right? Oh, mine Those is that not are smokeless. have an exhaust true. system and burn at a high heat and you know reuse the exhaust. I don't know it's if Chief Lovett wants to speak. Nice Sounds idea. like you may have admitted that you were violating the ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> Chief, do you want to clarify? <laughs> yeah, initially when the ordinance was first enacted, it was like 40 years ago, it was to prevent nuisance smoke in close-knit neighborhoods. Um, so initially when it was drafted, it did include the use of wood, charcoal, and propane, but then they found that so many folks were using the tree limbs that fell after a storm, wet stuff, things that we didn't want burned, it wasn't safe. So that was removed at some point somewhere in the last 40 years. So at this point, because of the new technology with these smokeless cookers, reburning the exhaust, that's kind of where uh, we were coming from. Figured it needed to be updated just because it was a 40-year-old rule that we hadn't looked at. Um, but as far as you know, cooking over an open campfire, um, by the way it's standing right now, it, it isn't uh, you know, allowed. With these smokeless cookers, it has a, a situation where it reburns, so you don't come, you know, crazy. Or some steaks on the grill. We'll come figure it out. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm using flavored wood, ch wood chips, so I, you know, and I'm pretty sure some of my other culinary guys out there, um, women, are all the same, same thing. But well, we did leave this ordinance in committee to revisit uh, okay. for right. further revisions. So perhaps <laughs> in the future it could be revised to include the kind of smoker that you oh, use, sure. Alderman McCann. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, to that point, that was something I noticed after the conversation that we didn't include specific smokers. Um, and, you know, not that they all have open flame. I've got an electric one, so technically I could use that and it wouldn't fall under uh, this because it's, it's not a fire. But I do think that's something we should try to address if we continue to work on this. All right. Any further discussion or debate on approving the revisions to this ordinance? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. The topic will remain in committee to discuss if other methods of outdoor fire other than a cooking fire could be added in the future. The meeting adjourned at 6 p.m. Thank you very much. Next, we have me with uh, reports of representatives. We have none, and reports of select committees. I have a report from the committee. The whole meeting of February 29th. This was emailed to board members. So committee members present included myself uh, and members of the board, Barb Gallo, Cooperly, Davis, Gillum, Hooker, McCann, Savage, and Taddeo. Others present, Mayor Dungis, Clerk Capusta, Attorney Lachance, Fred Polsonelli, Tom Daly, and Gordon DeTrillo. The meeting was called to order at 5.30 p.m. The purpose of this meeting was to allow for a more detailed examination of the cannabis retailers and manufacturers tier two application for Nona's Farms. Uh, I began the meeting by asking board members to review the Municipal Regulatory Authority Guidelines provided by the State of Vermont, which state that a municipality may hold a cannabis establishment to the same bylaws and ordinances that would apply to a non-cannabis business of similar character, and that any restriction on a cannabis establishment's ability to operate can only be based on zoning bylaws and or ordinances regulating signs or public nuisances. Fred Polsonelli, the representative for the applicants, explained their plans to open a, quote, mom and pop cannabis retail and manufacturing facility and their intention to hire up to 40 full-time employees. Alderwoman Davis asked if the applicants had any other locations in Vermont or elsewhere, to which Mr. Polsonelli replied that no, he and his partner Kelly have no other licensed operations anywhere. Alderwoman Savage asked about other partners, to which Polsonelli replied that their other partner is involved in cannabis manufacturing in Colorado, but that his role will be to train their local workforce in manufacturing. Polsonelli stated that Nona's Farms has no affiliation with any out-of-state cannabis operation. 
Older Woman Savage asked about their outreach to local cannabis businesses, to which Polsonelli replied that they currently have one full-time employee who have been making a major effort to connect with local cannabis producers and retailers. Alderman Gillum and Barbara Gallo asked a number of questions about the logistics of the facility and its operation, which Polsonelli answered to their satisfaction. Alderman Cupoli asked how employees would be vetted, and Polsonelli explained that the cannabis employees have to be state approved. Alderman Tadio asked if the employees would be full-time positions with benefits, and Polsonelli confirmed that they will be. Alderman Davis asked why they chose Rutland for their operation. Polsonelli stated that he grew up just across the border in New York, and they have family who live locally. Alderman McCann pointed out that this application is different from the cannabis applications to come before the board previously, in that their principals and registered agent are not based in Vermont, but he emphasized that the board does not have the capacity to regulate or restrict a cannabis establishment outside of making sure they are compliant with zoning bylaws and signage and public <coughs> nuisance ordinances. Alderman Tadio made a motion to refer the cannabis retailers and manufacturer tier two application for Nona's Farms back to the Board of Cannabis Commissioners for approval. Motion passed unanimously and the meeting adjourned at 5.58 p.m. <coughs> so we'll get to the Board of Cannabis Commissioners momentarily. Uh, next, with petitions, letters, and miscellaneous communications, we have a special event permit request from the Rutland County Parent Child Center for the Running for Prevention 5K to be held on April 27th. There's a copy of the permit on pages 57 and 58 of your packet. I'll move to suspend the rules. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion to suspend the rules. It has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And I'll move for the approval of running for prevention 5K run walk for April 27th at 10 a.m. I assume till 4 p.m. Second. All right, so we have a motion to approve the permit. It has been seconded. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, Board of Control Commissioners, we have nothing on the agenda. Board of Cannabis Commissioners, we have the Retail and Manufacturers Tier 2 applications for Nona's Farms. Copies of the application materials are on pages 59 through 65 of your packet. Can I get a motion to go into the Board of Cannabis Commissioners? So moved. moved. Second. All right, we have a motion to go into the Board of Cannabis Commissioners. It has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. What is the Board's pleasure? Alderman Barbara Gallo. Am I permitted to ask questions of the individuals applying? Yeah, Mr. Polsonelli, would you be comfortable answering any questions? Sure. Step to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go right ahead. Good evening. Sir, I just want to review a couple of things we went over at the meeting there. Yes. In, in the application, it stated that you were going to hire up to 40 full-time employees at a livable wage. What do you consider a livable wage compared to what the state of Vermont considers a livable wage? I mean, the price ranges would vary based on the position itself. You know, we've seen bud tenders and others from the 40000 a year on up. Um, and then you can have store managers and others who are involved in other parts of the business that could go even higher. You know, but I, we haven't seen it really drop below that forty to $50,000 a year range-ish depending on the position, and that, that would primarily be, I would think, a bud tender. The state of Vermont, I believe, says livable wages between 29 and $31 an hour. And I just didn't know if you fell within that guideline or not. We, we'll, we'll make sure we're fully compliant with all wages and everything is tracked with the state very closely, so we would always you know, remain in compliance. I mean, if, the, if that is the case, we'll make sure that the wages are in full compliance, of course. Okay, thank you. And one more question, just uh, on the application, I think I believe it, I read that you were investing forty-five or fifty-five thousand into the building. Uh, no, sir. I don't. We've we've invested significantly more to date in the building. Okay, so you, so what you? I remember you saying at the meeting you were investing over a hundred thousand. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I, I might have misspoke at the last meeting, but we've, we've spent um, significantly more than that also. More in the, to date in the $250,000 right. range. So does the application need to be updated to reflect that? I don't believe that it does. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from the board? Alderman McCann? I was uh, just going to make a motion that given everything that we've learned and the, the latitude that we do have, that we uh, approve application S00003253. Second. All right, so we have a motion to approve the applications, and it has been seconded. Discussion or debate on the motion to approve? Alderwoman Hooker. Uh, another question for Mr. Sure. Uh, 
fine. Um, you talked about training. Yeah. Could you just elaborate on that? Like what type of training will be done? We'll be doing training for retail and manufacturing. So everything from the packaging of different products and, and the communications with different suppliers to um, actual dispensary store activities that involve people at the point of sale system and really just making sure that um, especially retail employees are familiar with the products. They understand the lab testing and the reports so that when somebody comes in asking for a certain type of product, the, 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 the retail workers know what to provide. So if somebody comes in and they have a tr trouble sleeping, the bud tenders and the retail uh, workers will know exactly what type of product that that particular person may uh, benefit from. So, so really, okay. industry training, local training on compliance and regulations, um, understanding the lab testing process, understanding the different profile breakdown of the products. The training will be, you know, industry-wide, Vermont local, and then really product-driven and customer customer service. Okay. Mm -hmm. Additional questions, Alderman McCann. Yeah, so uh, at the last meeting, or the first board meeting when this came up, I, I shared some information from a letter we had gotten from uh, a concerned party. Uh, there, there was another letter from an anonymous source, I think, that came today, and I think that was shared with the applicant. Is that right? Um, so I, knowing that that's not something we can take into account, I just don't know if that's something we could or should share with the state when we send our sort of results of this vote back so that they are informed of the same concerns that we are. I would defer to the city attorney on what it's advisable we do with the anonymous letter we received. Um, so I would have to look into whether that would be advisable for us to send up to the state. Typically, practice would dictate no, it is just the board's decision okay. that goes up. Okay. Any additional debate or discussion on the motion to approve? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get a motion to go out of the Board of Cannabis so Commission? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. That brings us to unfinished business. Any unfinished business? Seeing none, do any board members have any miscellaneous motions, resolutions, or new business? Alderman McCann? Thanks. So as we saw tonight with our special events permit, our, our city hosts numerous special events each year, and I believe we have an opportunity to take a leading role in ensuring those events strive for environmental sustainability. Uh, collaborative efforts between the organizers and the city can enhance the sustainability of these events. I'd like to see the city develop and adopt an informational green events guide, which can be shared with special events applicants. I'd also like to see a question in the event application process that encourages applicants to outline the steps they've taken to minimize their events environmental impact. Various cities and organizations around the world have successfully implemented similar strategies that we can use as a foundation. However, in a quick search, I didn't find any similar guides from other Vermont cities or towns. This presents Rutland City with an opportunity to establish itself as a leader in this area within the state. Uh, beyond the evident benefits of reducing events contributions to climate change, embracing green event planning can also result in cost savings, particularly in terms of waste removal and cleanup expenses. I move that we refer the discussion of the creation of a green event guide and the inclusion of the permit application item related to environmental measures to the Environmental Sustainability Committee. Second. All right, so we have a motion to, to refer this to the Environmental Sustainability Committee. It's been seconded. Any discussion on the referral? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Alderman Gillum? Yes. Um, I'd like to put in committee a the water main replacement um, package that we were going to about to do here in the uh, spring um, unfortunately the the bids have come way over than what we have set up for our our um, bond of uh, 2.5 um, so we're going to have to pick and choose what um, projects that we want to do to get this off the ground the reason why we need to get this in committee right away because we got to get our, our uh, paving contract set up and uh, work with the state with their contract on four and seven in Cottage Street and Columbian Avenue and State Street. Some of these projects have to get done because we have to do the water main replacements that are gonna go into those projects. For instance, uh, uh, Chaplin Avenue, Morris Place, Madison, Water Street are a couple of them that we need to get the plumbing in before we actually do the paving with the state. Uh, so we're gonna to have to figure out how we're gonna do that. So I would like to put that, refer that into uh, Public Works. We will have a meeting next week 
And uh, Larry, you're not off the hook yet because you can still <laughs> come to that meeting because you're not done until the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Second. <laughs> All right. Second. So we have a motion to refer this to the Public Works Committee. It's been seconded. Discussion or debate on the referral? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And I have another one. Alderman uh, Gill. The, the sludge and what? Septic. Sludge and septic rates need to be adjusted uh, so we can cover costs because our costs have gone up. I'd like to also refer that to Public Works at the same meeting. All right. Second. So we have a motion to refer sludge and septage rates to Public Works. That's been seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Any additional miscellaneous motions, resolutions, or new business? I, go ahead. I would like to uh, take a little personal time here <coughs> and to congratulate Alderman Hooker and Alderman Kupla for completing their task here. And I know we didn't agree on everything, but I do have, you have my respect and, uh, and my best wishes for you folks when you leave us. You have done so much, especially Alderman Hooker has already had a 25 year career. Four, but who's counting? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> 34, but who's counting? <laughs> she was in the state house, she was a senator, she was a house member. I've worked with her at the house back in 92. So she's been there a long time. And Larry's been up there a while too, so you are, ending your so-called public service uh, servant uh, uh, positions and we really appreciate you doing that what you have done so far and i think the taxpayers and the voters in the survey should appreciate all the work you have done because i have one understand the many hours and the one dollar per meeting uh, that six you all cents. go to six cents whatever it is <laughs> um, and the work you have done and we really thank you for all that well thank you bill Thank yeah, I'd like you. to second Alderman Gillum and thank you both for your long careers of service to Rowland. Thank you. Is, is this the end of the short caucus? <laughs> oh, <I'm, laughs> yeah, this is it, the end of the short caucus. Um, <laughs> That was kind of a funny, if I may. <laughs> we, up in Montpelier, we started Short Caucus, and I remember going up to the podium when Shap Smith was the speaker <laughs> and saying, Shap, we'd like to invite you into the Short Caucus. He said, go back to your seat right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank, you, thank you all very much, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate it. And Cheryl and I are not leaving town, by the way. We, we don't <laughs> her around, so... I'm a, I know I'm around, but <laughs> so, thank you again. Thank you all thank very you. much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure to be here with you all. All right. If there's no additional miscellaneous motions, resolutions, or new business, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned.